and just wait for everybody to come in. <clears throat> okay, so good afternoon. We're now at the end of the day. I hope your day went well. I'm Maria Pereira. I am one of the co-directors of the Center for Community Health Equity and part of the faculty of the Department of Social Work at DePaul. And I'm also co-chair of the Coalition for Immigrant Mental Health. Welcome to our closing uh, keynote with Kim Wasserman. It is my honor to introduce Kim. Um, Kim is the executive director of the Little Village Environmental Justice Organization, Alvinco, where she has worked since 1998. Um, she joined Alvejo as an organizer and helped to organize community leaders to successfully build a new playground, community gardens, remodel of a local school park, and force a local polluter to upgrade their facilities to meet current laws. As executive director of Alvejo, she's worked with organizers to reinstate a job access bus line, build on the recent victory of a new 23-acre park to be built in Middle Village, and continue the 10-plus year campaign that won the closure of the two local coal power plants to fight for remediation and redevelopment of the sites. Ms. Wasserman is chair of the Illinois Commission on Environmental Justice. In 2013, she was the recipient of the Goldman Prize for North America. And her biggest accomplishment to date is raising three community organizers, age 18, 11, and eight. Welcome, Ms. Wasserman. Let me stop my share so you can share your slides. Thank you so much, Maria. I really appreciate it. And thank you for the opportunity to present today. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so we can start the presentation. Can folks see the screen okay? Yep. Great. Sorry, wrong one. Present, not share. There we go. Okay. Perfect. Um, well, again, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today. Um, we really appreciate it. Um, the timing of this conversation actually couldn't be better uh, for our organization as we continue on the road to fight for environmental justice in Chicago. Um, so um, 30 minutes goes by really quickly and there's a lot of information that I'll share. So if at any point in time folks have questions, please feel free. I think we have time for questions and answers at the end. Um, please feel free to, I think, throw them in the chat um, if that's okay. Um, and um, if I go too fast or if folks miss something, please feel free to let me know. I get really excited when I talk about work and I tend to talk really, really fast. Um, so my apologies. Um, but again, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. Um, as was mentioned, El Vejo is entering into its 26th year uh, as an organization. And I've had the privilege to be with the organization for 22 of those 26 years. Um, we are a non-for-profit located in the Southwest side of Chicago. Um, and our mission and goal is to achieve environmental justice through the self-determination of our community members. And what that basically means is that our community members know what's happening in their neighborhood. And more importantly, they know how to fix it. Um, and we consider them to be the authorities on how to, who should make decisions in our neighborhood and for what and how. Um, so we really lift up that model as part of our community organizing along with leadership development. And I'm gonna be talking about some of those examples of our work um, throughout this presentation. Um, so as was mentioned in the bio, um, our organization in the last 26 years has been able to do some really amazing work um, in the Little Village community. Um, one of the, when we started off as an organization, um, we did not come into our neighborhood with an authority voice saying, we know what's wrong with the neighborhood and here's how we think you should fix it. We were just like every other community member. We understood what the problems were, but more importantly, we wanted to know how our neighbors wanted to fix them. And so we spent the first three years of our organizing capacity just talking to people in the neighborhood, trying to understand what kind of problems that they see that we were having and how would they like to fix them. And there were four main topics that communities ended up voting on at the end of the four years. We had like 300 plus topic areas, but we couldn't do them all. And so folks refined that list down to four primary campaigns, um, a, a campaign to fight for more parks in our neighborhood. Um, in our heyday, we were about 107,000 people with only one park, and half of our population is under the age of 25. Um, so you can only imagine the lack of open space in our community. 
Um, the second campaign that we worked on was the public transit campaign. There was a three mile gap in the little village community with no bus service going east to west. Um, so it was really important for us to be able to help folks be able to access public transit in our neighborhood. Um, and then thirdly was the question of clean air. Folks understood that there was a ridiculously high asthma rate in our neighborhood, even though Mexican Americans tend to have an actually lower asthma rate in the United States, but in Little Village, that statistic did not stand true. And so people really wanted to understand what was in the air we breathe um, and how does it impact our health and what can we do about it? Um, the fourth campaign that we worked on, um, which isn't noted here, is rats. Um, there's historically been an issue of rats in the city of Chicago, and as much as I'd like to say that we've made huge strides around that campaign, that's the only campaign I would say that we are still working on, um, is the question of rodents in Chicago. <laughs> um, and so totally open if people have ideas or suggestions on that, as that continues to be an issue in our neighborhood, like many others. Um, but just to give a sense of the campaign work that we've done, all of these campaigns were over 10 years long. Um, so please know that this work is not happen overnight. It definitely is a long haul of work. Um, so it took us 12 years to shut down the coal power plant. It took us 23 years to get homes in the um, area of the Celotech site, which, is, which was a super fund site, um, tested and cleaned up. Um, 23 years because they had to find the owners, they had to figure out how they were gonna remediate it. And um, we fought with the US EPA around even how many homes and how they were gonna remediate um, these houses. And so that was a 23 year campaign. And through that campaign, not only did we end up getting 177 homes remediated and cleaned up, um, but we also got a park built on the former Superfund site. Um, so once the Superfund site was capped, um, it was downgraded to a brownfield. And then that brownfield was transformed into a park. And La Vita Park is the largest uh, brownfield to park transformation in the United States. Um, so really exciting to not only be able to provide folks with a cleaner environment around their home, but also with a 23 acre park on the east side of Little Village, it was so desperately needed um, during this time. Um, and then lastly, we fought for 12 years to get a community, a quarter acre community garden site put up in our community. Um, urban agriculture is a huge, huge part of our community's culture and our community's economy, um, yet there's not very many spaces dedicated to be able to grow your own food. Um, so we had to not only fight to get this space, but once we got it, the developer who came in to remove the industrial uh, legacy from there actually ended up making it more toxic. So we had to fight another five years to get them to clean that toxicity up before we could even use the site for a community garden. Um, so just the struggles that we've gone through, but successes that we've been able to win through our community organizing and leadership development. Um, and so we won these campaigns and people were like, hey, you're done. You guys did everything you wanted to accomplish. Like you get to retire now. Um, but the fact of the matter is that's far from the case. <laughs> um, these fights were not just about what's right. They're not just about what's morally just, they were about the health and environment of our community. And what does that actually stand for and mean, particularly for low-income communities of color? Um, and so one thing, a couple of things that I'm gonna be highlighting during this presentation is how we view our community's capacity perhaps differently than most do. Um, one of the main things that we do is empower our community members to know that they are the experts, that nobody knows their neighborhood better than they do. And in fact, when moms in the early 90s were concerned about their kids having asthma and concerned about air quality, their gut was absolutely right because little did they know that there was a coal power plant in their backyard that was primarily causing a lot of these incidences. And so it's really about ensuring that we understand and give space for community members to be able to embrace being experts of their community. They know what's wrong and more importantly, they probably have the answers on how to fix it, um, both from a culturally, uh, uh, culturally strong perspective, but also just from a perspective of knowing what's best for their families. Um, and so this is a value um, and a model that we lift up and fight to create space for in spaces where perhaps folks don't think the community members have a lot to offer. And I'll be speaking to examples around this in, um, further on in the presentation. Um, another highlight of our approach is very much understanding how structural racism plays into both the development and design of our communities, but the ongoing environmental racism that happens in our communities. We really focus on something called a just transition. Um, we recognize that we live in a very extractive economy. We live in a very extractive society and in a city where particularly the value of black and brown, where the lives of black and brown young people are continually devalued um, in our society. And so it's very important for us to recognize that and identify that and try to move us towards a regenerative economy, an economy that actually um, thinks about resources and thinks about regeneration and gives value back um, to our bodies as people of color, um, but also to our earth. 
Um, and so in that light, when you look at developments in our community, right, when they wanted to redo the Celotech Superfund site, they wanted to put a FedEx there and have a bunch of FedEx trucks parked on there. And we said, no, that's not what our neighborhood has asked for. And that's not what our neighborhood demands. We want a park. And so we fought to get that park. Um, when the developers came in to remove the industrial legacy at the community garden, right, that developer felt like this community garden doesn't matter, this neighborhood doesn't matter, and went ahead and proceeded and cut an oil barrel on top of the site and let all the oil leach into the site, right? We could have walked away and said this isn't for us, but we didn't. We stayed behind and fought to get that site cleaned up because we knew how important it was for our folks to access um, open space uh, to be able to garden. Um, and similarly to other projects that we have, we very much have spent 22 years focused on what are the strengths of our neighborhood and the food, local food economy is very strong. Um, in case folks don't know, 60% of street vendors in Chicago actually come from the little village community, yet we don't have a single uh, commercial kitchen in our neighborhood to help facilitate folks being able to continue to do um, street vending. And so it's very clear to us um, that while the city tries to provide folks with opportunity, they're not giving them the infrastructure that they need to be able to be successful. And so while the city continues to look to, at our community for other types of development, a more extractive development, we are lifting up the type of development that would bring solar opportunities, that would bring large scale urban agriculture opportunities, that would bring commercial kitchen opportunities, that would bring greenhouse opportunities, skills and spaces that, oh, I'm sorry, spaces that can develop the skill sets that our community members have. Um, now, why is this important? Well, for 12 years, we fought to shut down two of the dirtiest coal power plants in the nation. As I mentioned before, these coal power plants um, caused 40 premature deaths a year in our neighborhood. They caused 550 emergency room visits and over 2,800 asthma attacks. Yet nobody in our neighborhood was employed at these coal power plants. Yet none of the electricity that was created at these coal power plants was for the Chicago or Illinois area. This was all electricity sold onto the open market, right? And so what that told us was that 40 people in our neighborhood were worth dying, but we weren't worth the economic benefit, much less the job benefit, much less the localized energy from this company. And so it became very clear to us, right, again, how this extractive economy works and how we particularly as the Latinx community are placed um, in that value structure. Um, let me go back. Oh, sorry, let me go back. Dang it. There we go. Um, and so you fast forward, we were able to shut down the two coal power plants and we had worked with the city to develop uh, guiding principles around what we would wanna see developed on this property. And all of that was, to, was pushed to the wayside when Hilco developers showed up and decided that they knew what was best for our neighborhood. And that was a 1 million square foot warehouse for Target. So now we're going from a site of injustice that had coal power plant pollution killing our neighborhood to now a site of more injustice, which will have diesel pollution affecting our community members. And what we're being told is, you guys have a great workforce. You guys have a great community that can have these jobs. And what kind of jobs are we talking about? Warehouse jobs. Some of the worst jobs currently in the state of Illinois based on um, how much they use um, uh, contracting uh, uh, temporary job placement, right, wage theft, and just so many other issues, along with truck driving jobs, which don't provide health insurance, which don't get uh, employee benefits, but are actually seen as contractors. And so what we hear when Hilco and the city tell us that we have a great neighborhood is we hear we're an exploitable neighborhood. We're a neighborhood where um, we can pay your people very little and provide them with very little benefit because who really cares about the people in your neighborhood? That's exactly the type of message that we get with this type of development. Now, what I'd like to highlight as part of that is what our experience with this type of development is, right? So Hilco came in and donated about $130,000 to Rahm Emanuel, our former mayor. They came in and bought the property for 12 million, right? They gave our alderman $3,000. The coal power plant, at the very least, gave our alderman $5,000. They down, they, they lowballed him. They only gave him $3,000 to sell out this time, um, right? Hilco hosts two community meetings in our, in our neighborhood in which the neighborhood overwhelmingly tells them, this isn't the type of development we want. We do not want more air pollution. We do not want more trucks. We want to see something different here. And regardless of that, the plan commission and city council went ahead and approved their development. And what I'd really like to highlight here is that nowhere through this planning process, nowhere through this permitting process, did the question of air pollution come up. Nowhere in this conversation did the Chicago Department of Public Health get to have a voice and say, hey, this neighborhood has the second worst air quality in the state of Illinois. Hey, this community is already overwhelmed with trucks. 
hey, we don't think this is the right type of development for this community. And in fact, we'd like to see how you're going to mitigate the harms that are going to be created through the air pollution that you create. None of those things were part of the conversation in this permitting and process. Instead, what was the conversation is, how many construction jobs are you going to have? Right? What was part of this conversation is, Hilco, are you going to bring your headquarters to Chicago if we let you build this warehouse here? Those, that economic development was the priority and continues to be the priority for developments in our community. And the question of health and environment get pushed by the wayside, unfortunately. Right? And then what ended up happening is on Saturday, um, Holy Saturday of Easter weekend, April 11th, Hilco, during a pandemic, a respiratory pandemic, was allowed to implode their smokestack. And I raise this because when you want to talk about environmental racism, there is no better example than this right here. As I mentioned, during a respiratory pandemic in a zip code that was hit, that was one of the hardest hits and is again going back up to be second hardest hit again currently with the second resurgence, they were allowed to implode a smokestack. And just to give you context, Right When this implosion happened and that dust cloud swarmed our entire neighborhood, right, and we had a chance a couple of days later to talk to the city, we, we wanted to understand how did this happen? H how did this happen? And what we were told was we didn't think this was going to happen. We, we never thought that this is what's going to happen. And we could not believe it. We could not believe that folks had never bothered to look up how do you implode a smokestack? And you know what you find? Videos of dust clouds, right? The, the commissioner for the Department of Public Health herself had to sign off on this permit to allow this implosion to happen and how the health of our community during a pandemic was not weighed to allow her to say no is one of the biggest questions we have is how is it responsible right to allow a community to be impacted in this manner on a regular day, much less during a respiratory pandemic and to this day, we still don't have answers as to what was in that dust cloud. What did people inhale. What did people touch in, in the dust that they had in their windows? And I'm gonna to speak to you um, what we've been able to do since then. And if that wasn't egregious enough that we were impacted, and let me be clear, we got less than 24 hours notice that that implosion was going to be happening. Um, our alderman knew for 10 days and chose not to tell our community until 24 hours before it happened. Um, and because people were not prepared, because people did not know how to best protect themselves, because people did not know what to do, some folks went outside. And some folks continued on their daily lives. And some of those folks unfortunately lost their lives later on due to respiratory illnesses that they had had. Um, and we believe were um, aggravated due to the implosion. And so El Senor, El Senor Fernando Cantu unfortunately was one of those individuals um, that we lost in our neighborhood as uh, potentially due to the implosion that happened this morning. And that for us as a community is one too many lives to lose um, to this type of development. Now, as folks can imagine, we responded, right? We have done um, caravans, right? With COVID happening, we can't do a lot of civil disobedience where people are in direct connection to each other, but we have been able to do a number of caravans. We've collected over 20,000 signatures online. Um, the art that folks have created in support and allyship of this campaign has been astronomical. Um, the work that folks have created to speak to how disingenuine um, and how much our bodies as black and brown people don't matter um, spoke volumes as to how folks saw what had happened and how folks saw, felt like they were once again dispensable as a community. Um, we also did digital actions, right? We've been targeting Target. Um, I understand everybody loves Target and everybody loves a Target warehouse, right? And everybody wants to get their stuff faster. But the fact remains is that with our shopping habits, right, those warehouses have to go somewhere. And in our case, they're coming right into our neighborhood, right at the coal power plant. Um, and so for us as a neighborhood, it really became the question of how responsible does Target want to be? And do they want to continue to exacerbate environmental racism in our neighborhood? Or do they want to be a good neighbor um, and do this someplace else? Um, so we continue to target Target as part of our campaign. Um, but really what I wanted to lift up is the role that our community members have played um, in um, debating with the city and in pushing back with the city's response. So when the city came to us originally and said, we're going to build a warehouse, we said, okay, how many trucks currently go through our neighborhood? Nobody could answer that. We said, okay, what's the current air quality of our neighborhood and can we afford more trucks? Nobody can answer that. We said, well, okay. Can you at least tell us how many transportation distribution logistics company we currently have in our neighborhood to see if we need any more? Nobody can answer that. And so what we ended up having to do is as community members is empower ourselves to find those things out. So we are now entering year four 
of doing truck counting in our community. Uh, young people, but we work with an advanced placement statistics class at our local high school, um, which I'm really happy to say they run numbers for us. They put up video cameras and they year by year tell us how much our truck traffic has exponentially grown in the community. So when our alderman says, eh, there's like three trucks a minute, we can literally come back and say, well, what intersection did you count at? What time of day did you count at? How many days in a week did you do it, right? And did you factor in any of these variables? And how did you end up with that number? Because our advanced placement statistics class has done all of that for the last four years in a row and can stand behind the science and the numbers that they have produced today, right? We have out science the city of Chicago again and again. When we couldn't, when nobody could tell us what our air quality was, we went ahead and applied to a US EPA grant, a US Environmental Protection Agency grant, where we were awarded one of five awards to do low cost air monitoring in our community. And so for the last three years, we've done low cost air monitoring, both mobile and stationary across the Little Village community to be able to understand for ourselves, what is the current state of air quality in Little Village? And we've learned so much. I've learned about wind patterns. I've learned about which way the wind blows in the summer compared to the winter time. So when the Hilco implosion happened, we were prepared and said, hey, did you all have air monitors up? And where did you deploy them? And did you look at wind patterns, right? And when the city turned around and said to us, uh, yeah, we don't know. We just kind of put them up. Um, we put them up two days after the implosion because we couldn't find anybody to do it over Easter weekend. Um, and then when they gave us the name, the, the, the name and the, um, model number of the air monitors they were using, we said, wait a minute, those are not air monitors for outdoor air quality. Those are indoor air monitors for OSHA uh, violations, right? For picking up small particles in an enclosed space. You're not even using the correct air monitors to do air sampling in our neighborhood. So they had to go back and replace all of the air monitors that they had, right? So it's our young people who have done the community science, who have been empowered to understand QA, QC, quality assurance, quality control that can speak to, hey, what kind of windrows mapping did you do before doing the air monitoring? And when the, the city's own Department of Public Health can't answer those questions, that says a lot about how they view our neighborhoods, right? So this is an example of our young people doing the mobile air monitoring, rocking around the neighborhood. Um, we still require support around the analysis of data. There is a lot of data that comes from this. Um, and so we are trying to figure out better ways of breaking down that data, but we do try to tell the story of what we find day by day. Um, and this is a map of the purple airs that we currently use. And we're working with other communities to train them up on how to use purple airs. Because again, the city does not have up its own air monitors. They rely on the US EPA's air monitors, which there's only a couple in the city. Um, and in, in order for us to truly be able to make decisions around the health and environment of our communities, we need to understand what the baseline of what we're working with is quite honestly. Um, and there's also other ways in which we support the community, um, right? We understood that right when this pandemic happened, uh, particularly the Latino community and the African American community were extremely hard hit. And so one of the things we did was shift towards being able to supply uh, food for people in our neighborhood, right? So we um, developed the Farm Food and Familia program in which we currently feed about 350 families across the South Side and Little Village community, particularly black and brown communities with healthy organic food made by four chefs of color across the city of Chicago um, as a way to be able to respond to the pandemic in this time, already understanding that our air quality is screwed, already understanding folks that have been through the implosion, already understanding folks are losing their job and income. How can we best support folks? The second, ooh, excuse me, the second thing that we did, oh, I'm missing a slide, I apologize. Um, there was supposed to be a water slide in here. One of the things that we also did was provide uh, water. Um, the city was choosing to continue water cutoffs during the COVID epidemic, and we were able to stop them from doing that late, late or into the, into the pandemic. But in the meantime, um, we were able to fundraise and get folks water whose water had been shut off. But the city also didn't think about the weight of that smokestack that smokestack falling and what we heard from neighbor after neighbor was that their home bait their home structure shook that their whole house shook 
And so it led us to believe if the house shook, that most likely meant that their water lead lines shook and that the lead in the water most likely was aggravated when the implosion happened. And sure enough, we found families whose water had been impacted. And so we set out to provide them with both water and water filters. And we had to fight to get the city to come in and test people's water to actually show that the implosion had impacted the infrastructure because no, it didn't dawn on anybody in doing the permit that perhaps the weight of the, of the smokestack falling would cause issues with infrastructure across the little village community. Um, so things that as a city they aren't thinking about, but as communities impacted by environmental injustices on a regular basis, our folks are thinking about. And please know that this is not singular to Little Village. This is happening across the city of Chicago. On the southeast side, you have General Iron that's trying to move from Lincoln Park to the out southeast side. And folks down there are saying, look, no, like we just want to breathe. Right, we want a chance to be able to survive down here. General Iron has gotten away with paying $18,000 for all the things that they have done. Hilco had to pay 50,000 for all the things that they have done. And it takes our neighbors doing things like filing civil rights complaints to get the city to understand we are not gonna sit back idly and let you move polluters into our neighborhood and continue to act like we are expendable communities. Um, so this is a picture of General Iron um, and they call themselves a recycler, not a polluter. Right, that's what they say, we're, we're good for the environment, we recycle, right? And what the fact is, is there's so many fires and so many noxious odors that come from them, um, that in fact, that they are not environmentally friendly. Um, and similarly, you can find a struggle in McKinley Park. Um, there was an asphalt plant that was put in McKinley Park, literally right across from McKinley Park itself, like literally right across the street, because why not put an asphalt plant that deals with carcinogens um, across the street from where people recreate? And if that wasn't egregious enough, um, they are only uh, 580 feet, give or take, from a local school, right? So these children every day that they, when they are in the building, are breathing in noxious, toxic fumes from an asphalt plant. And because of the way the city is designed, again, environment and health are not taken into effect when these permitting processes are happening. Um, and that at the end of the day is one of the biggest struggles that we find. Um, so about a couple of years ago, we worked with the National Resources Defense Council to develop a map to show how all of these impacts, the impacts of industry, the impacts of the economy, right? The impacts of unemployment, right? How all of these stressors and, and um, exposures affect us as a community. And what you'll find on the right side of the screen in the map is a commutative burden map. Right? And what it shows us is what we've already known, that environmental justice communities are overburdened. Um, they are highlighted in red for a reason because they have so much shit happening in their communities. And when you overlap that with the cases of COVID, it's not by chance that those neighborhoods mimic each other. Right, where folks are dealing with the worst air pollution, where folks are dealing with just massive health issues, you're finding the highest rates of COVID and it's not by chance. And more and more science is proving the more air pollution you have in your community, the more likely you are to be impacted by COVID. Right, and so it, it doesn't stop at just the question of air quality. It also, it also contains questions around what happens when pandemics like this occur. And so for, oh, I'm sorry, there's my water slide. Oh put it in the wrong place, my bad, but this is the water program that I was talking about earlier. Um, excuse me. Um, but it's important to highlight that our work doesn't just stop at the environment, right? It's also the question of what, what are the demands that we're hearing from our young people? What are the demands we're hearing from our communities? And what are the things that we're seeing that we need to respond to? One of the things that I didn't mention was that Little Village is home to Cook County Jail, one of the largest metropolitan jails in the world. Right, and in our neighborhood, that's 96 acres that are dedicated to the to the um, incar in, incarceration of Black and Brown people. Right, we only had an 11 acre park, and then when we got our second park, we moved up to about 33 acres. So that means that there is more land dedicated to incarcerating our young people than there actually is open space in our neighborhood. Right, so just to give you a sense of the priorities that the city has in a community like ours, right? So when you when you add that, plus you have young people advocating for, hey, we don't want police in our schools anymore. When our communities are demanding, hey, we don't want to see a police budget anymore. That is in direct correlation to environmental justice, right? That is in direct correlation to the fights that our communities have had on their hands because we recognize this isn't just about bad players. This isn't just about people making lifestyle choices. This is about structural racism. This is around the fact that once again, our communities are allowed to be sacrificed for capitalism, for profit, 
for policing. And when we talk about as a city tackling structural racism from a health perspective, if we are not talking about policing, if we are not talking about education, if we are not talking about environmental justice, then we are simply providing lip service to the continualization of structural racism in our communities, quite honestly. And so it's incredibly important for people to understand that we're not just limited to clean air, clean land, and clean water. Right? We are talking about the dignity of people's lives, the value of people's lives. And as I mentioned, how do we go from an economy, from a space that looks to extract from us our bodies, our value, our minds, right, to one that actually is regenerative and lifts up those that are most marginalized in our community? Um, and so one of the ways that folks can support this work moving forward um, is to get involved with things like the Hillco campaign. Um, we just launched these really two dope billboards um, in the community right across the street from the Hillco site. Folks can text um, the number on the site um, and get involved in the campaign if they want to learn more. Um, and there's a couple of really cool um, articles that have come out over the last couple of weeks and specific to the Hillco campaign. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Um, and so oh, I'm almost at time. Sorry. <laughs> um, but for us, for me, it was really important to be able to correlate the work that we do as an environmental justice community to the broader picture of health and environment, as I mentioned. Um, for so long, you know, as a, as a community, we've been putting out these individual fires. And at one point, we had to kind of stop and ask ourselves, like, why do we have to keep putting out fires? Like, who decided that a warehouse is okay in our neighborhood? Who decided that it was okay for us not to have a park, right? Who decides that we shouldn't have a bus line. And what we started to find was there was very few people who were actually making those decisions. And in fact, it wasn't really people from our neighborhood that was making those decisions. And so as we started to understand more about planning, as we started to understand more about development, we started to pull in folks and say, hey, Department of Public Health, why aren't you in these conversations? Right, like, hey, how come you can't have a voice in what happens in our neighborhood and be able to say, hey, we don't think this is the right kind of thing for this neighborhood. We think that the health and the environment of this community is more important. And so for the last, I would say, five years, as a collective, Elveco and other members of the Chicago Environmental Justice Network, we've been really putting a strong, uh, a strong uh, campaign towards the city to get them to understand they need to rethink about how they do permitting in the city of Chicago. They, re they need to rethink about how they do planning in the city of Chicago. And entities like the Chicago Department of Public Health need to be given the power and authority to come into these spaces and say, no, this is not the right move for this neighborhood, or be able to ask the question of how do you mitigate the harms? Right, because those questions are not being asked. And in fact, they're being pushed to the end of the line. Um, the last uh, example I'll give is that I got to meet a former head of the Department of Transportation. Um, and I was talking to her and I wanted to understand, how do, do they have a voice in what happens? And she goes, let me give you an example. She said, there was a school built on the South Side. She goes, now, nobody brought us into the conversation until the very end. The school was built, everything is done. And then they bring us in and they said, hey, we built this school right next to a train line and we can't figure out how to get the kids safely to the school. Can you help us? And the Department of Transportation lady said, yeah, I wouldn't have built the school here. If you would have asked me to participate in this, oh, sorry. If you would have, if you would have asked me um, from the beginning, I would have told you this is the worst place to build a school because there's no way for us to get these students here safely, right? And so it just gave us a sense of who gets to make decisions, who gets to sign off on those decisions, um, and where does the voice of community and the future of community really lay in that. And so I hope this was a helpful um, conversation. Um, uh, as always, I have to share our social media things if folks want to follow us. Um, but just really appreciate the opportunity to be able to share so quickly um, in the work that we do um, and um, the fight that we have on our hands. So thank Thank you so much, Kim. That was a lot of good information. Um, I invite attendees to um, put their questions in the chat and any comments that you have. Um, and as you're doing that, one of the questions that I had, Kim, was um, how do you how do we stay informed about environmental justice issues, um, not only in Chicago and, and, and in the country? And also, you know, what are some things we can do on the ground day to day uh, to engage in advocacy? You know, what are some calls to action? Did I stop sharing my screen? 
Yes. Okay. Sorry. Just wanted to make sure. Um, yeah. So there's definitely ways that folks can um, find out what's going on. There's about five or six really great environmental justice organizations in Chicago, and I'm going to list them off um, and can follow back up with information. Um, so there is Blacks and Greens uh, located in Woodlawn. Um, there is the People for Community Recovery located in Al Alkale Gardens. There's the South, uh, the South Side, the Southeast, the South, SETF, South East Side, the South, carajo y medio, sorry. Um, South, anyway, and SETF, Southeast Environmental Task Force, I believe is how it goes. Um, there's a South Side Coalition to ban pet coke. Um, and then there's also um, uh, Ixchel um, in Cicero. So there are numerous environmental justice organizations. They're all linked to our Facebook page. Folks can check them out, as I mentioned, um, doing great work across the city fighting the good fight. And, and what I will say is that there are hundreds of these types of organizations across the United States. Um, and most of them um, are led by women of color um, because they understand and see the fight that's happening in their communities on a day-to-day -day basis. And so they're not very hard to find. If you look up at EJ organizations, some, something will probably pop up. Um, but it's important for me to highlight that before folks reach out and just start to volunteer or start to say, hey, I have time and capacity, it's really important for folks to understand that a lot of these organizations like ours work from a space of values and principles. And so if, if folks have a chance, I would highly recommend checking out the environmental justice principles. There's 17 principles in which we uh, lift up as part of our work. And there's also the Jimenez principles of democratic organizing. Um, and these are really important because they kind of draw the line in the sand of both our political values, um, but also how we work with folks. Um, and so it's really important for folks to check their privilege, to check their opinions, um, and to check themselves before going into these communities um, as part of the work. <laughs> That's great. And then can you speak to the resistance in the city in terms of um, engaging in this environmental justice framework? Why do you think it's it, there's so much um, resistance there? Yeah, I mean, I think unfortunately the city of Chicago is way behind most other metropolitan cities in embracing environmental justice, quite honestly. Um, I mean, we've seen cities even like Kansas pass environmental justice reforms um, in the Midwest, Kansas. You know what I mean? So it's just like, come on, Chicago, get your shit together. But I think the fact of the matter is, is that what you find in cities like Chicago is that they, they're, the blinders are on when it comes to both community development, but also to environmentalism, quite honestly. Like these cities like Chicago bite onto the Bloomberg fight, right? They, they, they want all these sustainability and resources, but what they don't want to do is take a hard look internally to see how they themselves are perpetuating environmental racism. Because what that causes them to do is actually acknowledge that they perpetuated, have to take accountability for that perpetuation and then actually change the system from within. And that's the one thing that we find the city struggles the hardest to do is much less acknowledge that they're wrong, but then go ahead and try to change it. And so what we're seeing is these, these fixes, these, these false fixes, they're like, oh, we're gonna pass an air ordinance or oh, right, like um, we're, gonna, we're gonna make statements like Hilco can no longer continue construction, but then two weeks later, they're able to go right ahead and do it. Right. And so part of this is getting them to understand that they have to work with community, that they're the ones who created this problem and probably not the best to fix it. Right. That the best thing for them to do is actually humble themselves and listen to community. And this isn't just across environment. This is across policing. This is across education. Right. The city has a really hard time humbling itself to say, perhaps we don't know what's best. Perhaps we do need to hear what our community is telling us and heed advice from those experts. Um, and that's a really hard thing to do because you're conceding power, right? You're conceding who is actually considered to be an expert and you're empowering folks then to be able to flex their civic muscle. Um, and as we saw in this election, that's hard as hell. <laughs> that's a hard pill to swallow. But I think it's important to lift up that as, as hard as it's been, there has been uh, some amazing victories by Black and Brown Indigenous organizers across the U.S. in this election in small wins and on a local basis, but also in things like Florida, minimum wage is $15 now, which is huge. You know what I mean? And so there's, I think it's important to acknowledge that when we talk about like those values that I talked about, when we talked about like the city, it's hard to say not only do we recognize uh, racism as an issue, but that we're gonna tackle it because that means tackling a lot of the internal structures that they themselves uphold, quite honestly. Thank you. Any other questions? 
<laughs> and we have some out there. That was a lot. And Kim, that, uh, that, it's been amazing to hear about the work that you and your staff are doing there at El Bayo. Um, I see in the chat, there's a question from Rebecca. How did the high school program start regarding statistical analysis collaboration? That's a great question. So um, we've always had our, our work is generational. We very much are about working with the whole family. So we will work with everybody from the nuggets all the way through the elders. Um, we have no problem taking heating advice from anybody in the neighborhood. And so when we went to our alderman, our former alderman and said, hey, how many trucks are currently coming through the neighborhood? Because we're seeing an uptick. Um, they, he's, he, he threw out this number. He's like, there's like three trucks an hour that go by like 30, 26th in California. And we were like, homie, that seems like a very like just like you just threw some numbers out there like we were like when when who who are you basing that off of and what and it was clear that he was pulling shit out of his ass like that's just it was just clear and so our young people were like well how do we figure this out and so we started calling the city we started doing our research and it turns out there had been no truck studies on the southwest side of chicago in over 25 years yet the city is approving warehouses every single week and more trucks are coming into the southwest side and so we were like, wait a minute, how are you making these decisions that more warehouses are acceptable when you don't even know how many trucks are coming through the Southwest side at large? Um, and so our young people, one of our young people was like, hey, we should just start counting trucks. And so sure enough, that's what we did. We pen and paper, clipboards, chairs, safety vests, um, sitting on the corner. And we just, that's what we started doing. And we differentiated diesel trucks from regular trucks. Um, and we just started counting them. And little by little, we started to learn through our partnerships with folks like UIC, right? That there's things like quality assurance and quality control. And like, how do you do data collection, right? Picking the same times of day, picking the same days of the week, right? Just thinking through some of these things. Um, and, and we started in our partnership with the, um, with the high school, the AP statistics teachers came to us and said, look, I think this is a perfect project. Like we can put the students to work. They can, so they set up video cameras. They let them run for days on end. Then they would go back, download the data and count the trucks and then give us our reports. And then they were doing this year by year and then comparing year by year. And so that led to the city actually finally conducting a truck study on the Southwest side, which they just put out the RFP to do, um, the request for proposals to do that. So congratulations to our young people for making that happen because without them, that would have never happened. Um, because again, we're in, we're in public meetings and we're asking them how many trucks and they don't know. And our young people are like, well, we do because we counted for the last three years, right? Like, I mean, it just speaks so much to just the amazingness of these young folks um, and similarly the air quality. And so it really was young people seeing the opportunity, the, the, the gap of information and saying, we can cover that gap. We, we have what it takes to cover that gap. We just need support around that. And that's what we did was we provided them support. And for us, um, community science is really important. Because as I mentioned, um, particularly as a woman of color in, in leadership position, it's very hard for folks to take myself seriously, much less the work that we do seriously. And so it's incredibly important for me to ensure that our young people and that our community members can go toe to toe with whatever expert is out there and can speak to um, whatever science they're speaking to from a community perspective. Thank you, Kim. And that's, that's a great question. And before you leave that thought, and I have one hand up, um, for those who are academics on the call or listening, um, if you could do some research or, you know, to build on that, the high school students work, um, you know, what, what would be helpful to you in terms of um, projects that academics and researchers can get engaged in to support the work that you're doing? Absolutely. I, I appreciate that so much. Um, at one of the Hilco meetings, um, we had professors from UIC speak up and be like, this is like, this is ridiculous. Like, what are you all thinking? And even their voices were ignored just to give you a sense. And so we recognize the importance of having um, a, a, a variety of voices. Um, there is not a lot of information around transportation in Chicago. Um, Chicago mm -hmm. does not have necessarily a port authority. Other cities that see the, so let me back up. Chicago sees 30% of all U.S. goods come through its train and truck routes. So we see 30% of all U.S. goods come through, the, come through Chicago. However, we don't have a port authority that keeps track of that. So if you go to like the port of Long Beach, if you go to the port of Galveston, you will have a port authority that actually knows how many trucks are coming in and out, how many trains are coming in and out, 
What is the product that they are carrying? How far is it going, right? They can speak to volume. They can speak to uh, tons of air pollution. They can speak to um, weight. There's nobody in Chicago keeping track of that, right? Mm -hmm. And as a city, our mayor has said, we're going to double down on being a, a transportation hub. Well, that all sounds good and great. But until you actually start to understand how many trucks are currently going to Chicago, we're going to, it's going to be nuts here at some point. Like it's already nuts. It's going to only going to get worse on our infrastructure. And so we need support and understanding, right? We know all the, uh, tr um, the train yards are on the Southwest side, on the South side, they go from Woodlawn all the way to Cicero, mm -hmm. right? We know the train yards are all outside. And what we don't know, what we struggle with is what is their capacity? Like how much product are we talking about here, right? Like how many trucks are we talking about here? How much air pollution are we talking about here? Nobody can help us understand that. And we really need to be able to understand that to be able to push on the city for the reforms that we need. So definitely data, 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 um, and help with analyzation of air quality data. That's the other thing, right? Like, yes, we're a community scientist, but we're not data analysis. Um, and so these, you know, these monitors are spitting out data once every couple of minutes, and that adds up. Um, and it takes money and capacity to be able to break down that data. And we do have a partnership with UIC, but it's a small one. Um, and so we're barely breaking down the data from April 11th um, because we still haven't been able to get answers from the city. Um, and so any support that folks can give around data analysis to be able to tell the story of what is it that people are inhaling would also be incredibly helpful. Fantastic, thank you. I'm gonna call on Camille DeMarco. Camille, are you there? You have your hand up. I think Camille's on mute. Just asked to. <coughs> Unmute you, Camille. Camille, are you able to unmute yourself? I just asked you to unmute. Okay, I'm sorry, Camille. If for some reason I can't unmute you from here. <clears throat> Do you wanna... Um, Write down your question on the chat. And then um, Camille, as you do that, if you are able to do that, I hope you can. I'm so sorry, uh, we can't hear you. Um, but I wanted to um, highlight Rebecca's comment. Um, thank you so much for your answer and transparency. Are you comfortable sharing your email for future collaboration for people that want to engage in community research using your model in community science? Absolutely. Um, I can uh, dictate my email. It's kwasserman at lvejo.org. It's on our website. You can find it. Um, it's readily available. Um, and I would highly recommend folks check out our website. Um, we actually have um, a kind of uh, a work with Advoco 101. So we get bombarded a lot of times with university partnerships. And as I mentioned, we very much work from a place of values and principles. And so what we've done is develop a one pager for folks to understand how to approach us around partnership. Um, and, you know, we've gotten everything from folks writing us into a grant without our consent um, and then coming to us and being like, hey, I got this funded and I need you to do, you know, X amount of work and I've never talked to you about it. Um, to folks showing up and being like, I want you to do $5,000 worth of work that's actually really $50,000 worth of work. And so it's really important for us uh, to work in collaboration um, with university partners. Um, and so we have that as kind of a way to let folks know, like, we ask that you 
get down in this fashion. And if you can't, then we perhaps are not the partner for you. Um, and again, it's really important for us because we recognize that we work in a non-for-profit industrial structure. We recognize the history of black and brown bodies around um, the question of science. Um, and so it's really important for us to honor what has gone wrong in those situations and try to um, create uh, relationships in a different path moving forward. Um, so I would invite folks to check that out if that's helpful too. All right, thanks, Kim. <clears throat> a comment from Magdalena, as a little village resident, thank you so much for what you do for our community. Um, and then um, from Lori, how do you sustain a spirit of positivity within Little Village? Oh, good Ooh, question. That's a good question, especially that's a loaded these question. Um, you know, quite honestly, it's, it's not always been easy. Um, we've really spent, I would say, the last five years working on what we call a just culture, um, which is recognizing how hard organizing is, quite honestly, and recognizing that we need to put more value towards um, our organizers, um, that it should not be acceptable for organizers to burn out, that it should not be par for course that organizers don't make a, sustain, a, a living wage or a sustainable wage. Um, and so we've really shifted our culture organizationally to support our organizers in a better fashion. Um, we offer mental health support. Uh, we offer mental health days. Um, we're trying to offer health insurance as an organization to our staff, um, right? And just ways that we can support our organizers because this work is hard, right? Like I mean, the environment is failing on, we're, we're failing on our environment and we aren't gonna have much left to live off of as a, as a, as a people if we don't get this right. And that's depressing ass work. Like that is hard enough work as it is and much less you have to go out into community and talk to them about what they have going on and internalize all of those issues. And so folks are counselors, they're mortgage specialists, they're divorce attorneys, they're social security workers, right? Like they're doing it all. Um, and so it's really important for us to ensure that we support our staff as best as possible. And at least for me, um, what motivates me is my children. Um, I got into this work because my kid developed asthma at three months and I wanted to understand what I did wrong and how I could better be a better mom. And three children later, all three of them have asthma. Um, and I just learned that that's just the environment that I live in, um, but that doesn't stop me from trying to fight to make it better for them. Um, so they're, they're the reason that I get up every day and do this work, um, along with the fact that I'm empowered by my community, um, right? It's our community that's telling us that this is what we demand and this is what we want. And I take that very seriously and I take that to heart. Um, so as long as I'm empowered by our community to keep doing this work, then I will get up every single day and execute it to the best of my ability because we deserve, just like everybody else, access to clean air, clean land, and clean water, regardless of our language or documentation status. Great. Any, any other questions or comments for Kim? <clears throat> and I apologize for hearing Lila or a puppy in the background. But I think that's actually a good note to end in. Um, <clears throat> it was really good to hear your work, Kim. Um, thank you for sharing and thank you for spending the afternoon with us. Um, there's a lot of work to be done, but I think it's been amazing to hear what you're doing and it inspires many of us to to follow and to respond and take action. So thank you. Um, thank you for the opportunity. Yes. Um, just to close, I just want to um, say a word or two before we close. Um, many of you are in different sectors um, doing um, health equity work. And if you wanna share any other events that are coming up that um, we can be informed by, you know, as we talked today, there's been some amazing sessions and talks around um, racial justice and um, promoting health equity in different realms and in different disciplines and in different um, sectors and what we do. Um, we're also promoting, promoting a healing justice dialogue series um, in collaboration with different entities. Um, this Monday, November 9th, Fania Davis will be talking to us about restorative justice and um, Pulitzer Prize journalist Jose Antonio Vargas will also be talking um, on Friday about community wellness next week, a week from today. So I wanted to share that with you. And 
this uh, information you can um, um, you can access on our Center for Community Health Equity uh, website under the Healing Justice uh, Dialogue series under the tab work. Um, and Kim, I see another um, comment. Thanks so much from Patrick. Uh, I love the part where you let folks know how to partner with you, which is wonderful. Large institutions often impose on uh, community-based organizations so much. Yes, yes, yes. Um, I want to thank uh, the, the presenters from today. We had a presenter from Canada. We had an attendee from Tel Aviv. Uh, there was a lot of folks who came to learn, and there was some rich dialogue. Uh, and I really enjoyed the discussion that was had. Uh, so thank you. Thank you to the attendees. You'll be receiving a feedback form very soon. If you have not already, please take a moment to fill it out. We want to do this again. Uh, there were um, many folks, we have 400 folks who registered for this conference. And um, it's very clear that this is, we're offering something that um, allows folks to connect and come together and stay informed. So your feedback is really invaluable to us and it will inform our, our planning for next year. Um, and on behalf of the co-directors of the Center for Community Health Equity, uh, Dr. Raj Shah, Dr. Fernando de Mayo, and myself, I want to thank the uh, Public Health Program, John Mazio, Emily Tamblin, Aaron Augustine, and Priya Wade for all your assistance in making this happen. Um, particularly Victoria, you're the one behind the scenes doing um, a lot of the details and logistical work. And you're leaving us today, and we're going to miss you. Um, we're not happy with your leaving at all. But we thank you. Uh, we hope that it was a good day for you to end um, your stint at the call. And we look forward to seeing you still again. To all the attendees, <clears throat> many of you have asked if the sessions are recorded. This session is recorded, and we recorded many of the sessions. And we hope to put it up on the Center for Community Health Equity website soon. If you want to learn more, please go to our website. Please go to the uh, public health website. The poster presentations also, you may not have had time to visit them. There are some really wonderful presentations there. So I would encourage you to visit them. Um, I think that's about it. Victoria, do you have anything else to say? Um, thank you, Maria for your kind words. Thank you, Kim, for giving us such an amazing closing keynote. This was so inspiring and we can all take what we learned and go out and make a difference. Um, just thank you to DePaul and thank you to the MP program. It's been a really awesome 4.5 years and I um, am gonna miss you all, but thanks so much. This is a great way to end my time at DePaul. Very good. So. We wish you um, many days of hope, many days of inspiration, um, much good health and wellness, and we hope you enjoy the weekend. Um, have a good afternoon, everybody. And thank you again, Kim. Thank you so much. Have a lovely afternoon, everybody. You too.